I think so. Hey, BJ, you're on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I guess I need to unmute my screen, though. I'm going to unmute myself. Yeah, I think most people just start right now are muted with their videos off. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody, I think we figured out what the problem is. At least I can see you all now and participants are starting to come in. Um, I'm going to we're, we're streaming to a different YouTube channel than I anticipated. And so I'm going to update that on our Forge's Facebook page and then we'll get started. Lisa, will it be live streaming on Facebook? It was going to be, um, but because of technical difficulties, we went with the path of least resistance this morning. Got it. So we're going to the extension YouTube, I believe.
All right, everybody, we have had a lot of technical difficulties because of Zoom updates this morning. Um, we still have some people logging in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lisa Baxter, and I'm the UGA State Forage Extension Specialist um, based down here at the Tifton campus. Um, we you know, definitely had a challenging year in terms of COVID and quarantine and all that. So you know, glad you all are still willing to, to join in on these virtual programs like this. Um, just want a few housekeeping things here. Um, all participants are muted, um, so that way we don't have to worry about feedback of microphones or anything like that. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in that Q&A um, box you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and that way we can keep better track of the questions and go through and mark them as answered as we, we get to the end of the presentations. Uh, if you have a problem with hearing us or you can't see the slides or anything like that, um, please drop those in, in the chat box. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Jennifer Tucker on here with us today. Um, she is a UGA um, associate professor now in the animal and dairy science department and focuses a lot on grazing and alfalfa research. Um, and she's going to help monitor those questions um, and, and concerns so we can keep this webinar rolling forward this morning. Um, we have a great group of speakers lined up, and I'm really excited to hear from a lot of them that yeah, they get to talk after I do this morning. Um, so we're going to cover a few basic things just first off to give people you know, a little more time here to log in. Um, I give this as an agent training or more expanded version as an agent training quite often. Um, it, there, there's little things that we tend to forget going into hay season. So this is kind of the, the Cliff Notes version here. Um, so step one, if someone says, you know, we need, we need to make good hay, here's, you know, these are some of the things that we, we start talking about. Um, by far, you know, the, the biggest problems that I see is cutting too short in terms of our, our hay production. So a lot of us that are logged on, I believe, are kind of from Bermuda grass and Bahia grass country. Those we need to be cutting at three inches. Um, if you're up in the northern part of the state or in other parts of the southeast, you likely have tall fescue. And we recommend that you cut that at four inches because it is more of a bunch forage rather than prostrate growing like these two are. Alfalfa, based on current or re recent research, we recommend cutting at four inches as well. Where clovers grow a little more prostrate, we can knock that down to three inches. And you'll see the little asterisks that we have here besides small grains and uh, the, the winter annuals. And that's because we can't just rely on height alone with, with those forages. We have to look at the height that we're cutting 
and the stage of growth that it's at, especially if we're, or we're expecting to regrowth so that we can cut again. So it's a bit of a moving target with those forages. The second big thing is harvesting on time. Um, most actively growing forages should be harvested every 28 to 35 days. And there's a, a big emphasis there on the actively growing part. I know a lot of us here are, are struggling with kind of short-term drought here at the moment. Um, and so that means we're gonna be stretching closer to, to 40 or more days just to get enough material so that we're able to, to cut and bale. Um, so actively growing means that it's been fertilized, it's getting water, you know, we're checking all those boxes um, so that we are able to, to, to harvest that material at the point where we're really optimizing quality and quantity. Um, and, and the follow-up question to that is, well, what about rain? Well, rain damage depends not only on the, the volume of rain, but also the species that we're working with. So if we have um, something like Bermuda grass, uh, we don't stand to lose a lot in terms of, of yield loss because with that warm season forage. Now, if we're talking about, you know, five, six, seven inches of rain, that may change things. But these small summer rain showers that we tend to get, we don't stand to lose a lot. We, we stand to lose more quality by delaying our harvest than that little half inch of rain that we tend to get in the afternoons. Um, now, something like orchard grass or tall fescue, that we've got to be a little more careful with. Um, we would anticipate um, you know, so, some more severe losses from those cool season forages because they have a higher sugar content and a different cell wall makeup. Um, they just, they stand to lose more. It also depends on the timing of that rain. Um, if, if it gets rained on right after we go in and harvest uh, or, or cut that forage down, we don't stand to lose a lot in terms of quality. So NDF is, a term, is one of the quality terms that we use and the lower the number, the better. We do start losing quality if it's at that moisture where we should be going in to start raking or if we are, are close to baling. That's where we stand to, to really lose a lot of quality because of the, the dryness of the forage at that time. So the next one is to make good bales. Um, we're talking about good bales, not necessarily in terms of quality right here, um, but in terms of density or uniformity. Um, this is going to aid with storage and fermentation in terms of, of hay or, or fermentation in terms of baleage. Um, so we, we don't tend to think about the you know, good bale shape and density as more of a something aesthetic, but there's a lot that that plays into down the line. Uh, if we want to look at, you know, kind of the proportions of a, you know, say a six foot diameter bale, and I'll go ahead and put all these on there. Um, just in that outer four inches of the bale, we're, we're looking at a 25% um, of the material there. And, and you can see how drastically it starts to increase as you get towards the middle. Um, that inner three foot of the bale only represents 25% of that bale's weight. And so, if you think about those bales that we see, you know, as you're driving along and sitting on the side, or these are just sitting on the side of the road, um, you go and spear that bale and pick it up. You likely lose a lot off the sides, maybe some quilt peel off the top, but you definitely lose some off the bottom. You may be losing up to, you know, 50, 60 percent of that of your product there um, just because it was possibly baled incorrectly or stored incorrectly. Um, so it's something to keep in mind, especially as we do get drier and these hay resources become more valuable. We also need to fertilize strategically. Um, that includes splitting that nitrogen across the season, putting out lime. Um, many of our soils in the southeast are deficient in potassium, so we can't forget about the potash in terms of stand longevity. And again, we can't forget about that lime. It's on here twice for a reason. Um, I know fertilizer prices continue to, to tick up even by the by the day sometimes. Um, and so if you're a an animal producer um, or trying to produce forage for for your animals, there's if there's one thing that you take away from from this part of the presentation, um, if there's one thing that we can do to our, our pastures and hayfield this year, um, it's to put out that line. So I'm often asked what does it affect the forage quality more? Harvest timing or fertilization? Our crude protein does increase with fertilization. So you'll see here 
that the scale goes all the way up to 1,400 pounds of nitrogen per year, that'll break the bank. Um, what it also doesn't tell you is this is crude protein. It's not necessarily good and usable protein. And so if we try hard enough, we could get Bermuda grass up to 24, 25% crude protein, but everything above about this level right here is likely nitrates. Um, and that'll, it's very, it's very, very toxic to a lot of classes of animals. Um, and so what would, you'll see here at the red line um, that if they're representing digestibility, it remains relatively unchanged. And so even though our protein goes up with fertilization, our digestibility does not. And so really when terms of good quality forage, that's where our, that's where our cutting on time um, comes, comes into play. And the last kind of quick reminder here is just to scout early and often. Um, each weed and insect has an optimum time for control, um, but proper ID is going to be critical. And this is whether we're talking about insect pest or if, if we're talking about just different weeds that are out in our pastures or hay fields. Everything has that right time that we need to be out there and controlling it. And you'll hear more from that um, it, with some of our, our speakers following me today. So some other factors that can affect forage quality or yield is our forage species and variety. Um, we encourage you to use the highest quality species that will persist in your environment. Um, we want to make sure that we're protecting our bales from, from rainfall and weathering. Um, so storing them correctly, whether it's in a barn or storing them, you know, in the ideal situation outside. Um, and then getting that um, hay product to the correct moisture at baling. Um, or if you're working with baleage, um, being in that kind of 40 to 60 percent range. And so you may say, well, all this is well and good. That's what the textbook says. Um, but sometimes the difference between, you know, good hay and great hay was, was my hay equipment set up correctly and was it ready to go? Um, there, there's nothing more frustrating than having hay ready to go and then having a baler issue and you just can't get it bailed up um, before that rain comes. Um, so we, we ought to say that hay season never really stops. It's just you may not be in the field harvesting during all times of, of that hay season. Um, so that's where the off season really comes, comes into play. Um, so when we start looking at how do we make our equipment work for us in terms of producing the best quality hay or baleage possible. Um, there are you know, several examples here and depending on your screen is, is how good you can see a lot of these. Um, you may say, you know, what's, what's wrong here? Um, there was some, some hay that wasn't, some grass hay that wasn't cut very well because of the particular mower. Um, you can see the windrow is kind of um, uneven because of that, the, the mowing job there. And, and all of this was, it was a, a maintenance issue. Um, same thing here with our different, you'll see kind of the waves across the field. And I see this again and again with a lot of disc mowers. Um, what it's leading to is we have kind of, it's either cut too low here or it's really too high here. And it sets us up for a lot of problems in terms of even regrowth, um, because then we have you know different times we're gonna hit optimum for a lot of management across this. We talk about equipment maintenance a lot um, and that's, you know, Wheel rakes have that their goods and their bads here, but you will see on, on this particular one, there's a whole lot of teeth missing. Um, so there's likely wherever the, it rolled over the field, and you know, in this case or in this case here, there's likely material being left in the field. Um, and that's just that's that's dollars or potential pounds of gain or something that however you want to quantify it, that's being left there on the ground. Uh, when we look at our, our rakes and, and, and tedders, whichever one you want to kind of envision here, and we see a lot of material coming off of it, um, that sets us up for a lot of ash content in the forage, which can ultimately affect the digestibility of that forage. Um, probably one of the, the greatest quotes I ever heard on this was by one of our um, retired professors, uh, Dr. John Bernard, and he said that um, a rake and a, and a tether, they're not tillage pieces of equipment. We've got to get them up off the ground um, because all of this material that you see kind of flying behind this rake here, um, it, that's 
that's animal gain right there. And, and that's the quality that we're trying to look for and to ultimately get into that bale and it's just flying away. Um, we also want to avoid situations like this, um, that there's a lot going on with this particular bale. Um, it's, you, you see kind of the big lump that came in here at the last minute. Um, this is a bale that was baled way too fast and there, it's just, it doesn't have that good density and that round shape that we're looking for. And so every problem that we looked at um, was likely just caused by the by operator error or a poor setting, or it's, it's simple maintenance that we need to do. And so we're gonna look here at how do we actually go in and fix these problems? So the biggest issue that I see with the mowers is that we, we tend to, to not change our blades often enough or, or keep an eye on them. Um, the whole haymaking process starts with a good cut and that starts with a good set of blades. We wanna check our blades before every cutting, um, replace any blades that are chipped, worn, or even you know missing in this case here. Um, and ideally we're gonna change all of our blades at once across that whole cutter bar. Um, we don't wanna just change you know two or three here at a time. Um, we wanna go in and change every blade on, on every disc across that cutter bar. Um, if there's any little nicks like this, and that's really common, especially in the Southeast um, with little pebbles and rocks that are in the field. Um, these have just been used way too often. And you can see there's one that's just missing here. Um, in, in the grand scheme of hay production, in my mind, blades are fairly cheap. And it, this, is a, this is the critical first step um, so that we have we, we've set ourselves up for success if we can get through this step right here. Um, to get that best cut possible, there's some things, you know, blades are important as we just talked about, um, but also making sure that the our shoes are good on, on our mower and we've got that pitch set just right. Um, and, and this is a lot, There's a, depending on the mower you have, there's a lot of adjustments you can make. And it's really working with your, your local dealership or your product specialist to, um, to figure out what that best setting is for your particular mower. So let me get all these up there. There we go. Um, we often talk too about the importance of harvest height. We just mentioned that in the first part of this presentation. Um, it, by increasing that harvest height, um, we're, we're kind of doing twofold. Um, so first off from the animal side, um, we're decreasing that, that ash content. So it's gonna be better in terms of digestibility. In terms of keeping the, the mower up out of, kind of the, the sand or, or, or soil part, um, we're gonna have less wear and tear on our mower, which ultimately leads to more digestible forage. Another way to look at it is by increasing that harvest height, we're helping um, kind of re reduce that dependence on those root carbohydrates. Um, we're, we're bouncing back into photosynthesis faster to help replenish those carbohydrates because that's ultimately what helps us with that faster regrowth and more resilient forage. Um, the best thing that we can do to keep a, a good healthy stand is it ultimately goes back to that harvest height. The healthier, more resilient we can keep that canopy, the fewer weeds we're gonna have, the better it can withstand pe pest pressure. Um, the, and it leads ultimately to a healthier root system which is gonna get us through these times of drought. So increasing that stubble height can also reduce drying time. Um, so it essentially builds a little mat up off the ground. So you may have a lot of soil moisture down here, but if you can leave that three inches or so, because um, my little Lego here is about an inch and a half. So if there's three inches to where that cut forage just falls right on top of that canopy instead of down here on the ground, it essentially provides a lot of airflow up under that canopy there. Um, so then you're not only drying from the top, you're also drying from the sides and the bottom, um, which is gonna help reduce that drying time. We also wanna make sure that we're choosing the right conditioner. Um, in many cases, we are gonna recommend a mower with a conditioner if at all possible. That conditioner helps reduce drying time by increasing the surface area. Um, there's, there's two types of conditioners available. The first is an impaler or tine type. And we use these on, on small stem grasses, there's things like um, Bermuda grass, 
or, or even um, ryegrass. And so what it, it comes you know, into the mower and there's little metal arms and it all depends on the model that you have. They look something like this. Um, and then it's pulled out the back here. A roller or crimper type conditioner is better for large stem grasses and legumes. So this would be something like millet or sorghum and then alfalfa and clover. Um, so what it does is it, is it pulls it through, it crimps that stem, as you can see here. Um, it's gonna help expose more surface area and this drastically will reduce your drying time compared to just a mower alone. And so we, we get into great debates of, you know, can a mower conditioner just replace a tether? Um, ideally using a mower conditioner with a tether is the best option for rapid dry down. Um, the fewer times that we have to go in and ted that hay, the better. That's the more quality that we're able to retain. Um, if what we run into is that if we use that tether incorrectly, um, we actually can end up increasing the ash content. Um, so the tether works by putting the, these little tines down here into the forage and then spreading it out. So we move from swath rows, like what you see on the left side of the image, into kind of full field coverage of that forage, like you see here in the center to the right side. Um, what we we often see the tether used incorrectly, um, which can lead to a lot of leaf shatter. Ideally, we're gonna run that tether when the, it's, the forage is still above 50% moisture or morning dew is still present um, to help prevent with that leaf shatter because then those leaves is where all of our nutrients are and what we need to protect that forage quality going forward. Um, so if, if given the option, we really want to recommend both a mower conditioner with the tether, both for that rapid dry down and because that tether offers so much flexibility in our hay harvesting cycle um, that we can use it in, in multiple ways to really promote good, good forage in that dry down process. So when we adjust that tether, um, I think I've got another slide there. There we go. Um, we want to set the tines that you see here to just brush the top of the stubble. They don't need to dig into the ground at the front of the tether because most of them are going to be shifted forward, kind of like you see here. Um, so when we adjust it, and there's usually a, a adjusting arm up near the top center, uh, we want to make it where those front tines are just brushing the top of our canopy. And so by leaving that three to four inch stubble height, depending on what crop we're working on, that's gonna help prevent these from digging into the ground because the tines will just sweep across the grass and keep, and keep throwing that dry hay material back rather than digging into the ground to get that good throw of the hay. So there's a lot of debate over you know, kind of which is better and they all have their pros and cons. And so where we're talking about a rotary rake like you see here on the left or a more traditional wheel rake like you see on the right. Um, there's, there's other rake options out there like bar rake, but mo most of the Southeast is using um, one of these two with the exception of up in the mountainous regions. Um, it, like I said, they, they've got their pros and cons. Um, a rotary rake is going to be more expensive than a wheel rake, um, but it is it's definitely one of those situations of you get what you pay for. Um, we usually can't drive as fast with a rotary rake. Um, wheel rakes are sometimes called speed rakes um, because you can, you can really go across the field pretty fast with them. Um, but with the rotary rake, we can actually start raking earlier than we can with the wheel rake. Um, because of that, it's gonna, the, the, because of the windrow shape that it makes, it's more conducive to drying within that windrow. Um, and so it's actually gonna dry faster once it's windrowed than the wheel rake would. By being able to rake earlier, we have a lower likelihood of leaf shatter and a lower likelihood of ash content entering that windrow and ultimately our bale, which leads to a, a higher quality product in the end. So when we set our, our rake, um, and we had, there was a, a quote from Hay and Forage Grower a while back that I really enjoyed. Um, it said an improperly adjusted rate can turn a potentially high quality crop 
into a product with too few leaves and too much soil. And so what you see kind of, kind of here, um, we want those tines to just, again, sweep across the top of the, the canopy there, just like we talked about with the tether. Um, so just across the top of the stubble, and it's going to rake that dry forage into, into that, that windrow there in the middle. And so finally, we get to baling. Um, and and there's, there's not a lot that we, we have on, on here. If you think about it, we had in-person demos. The baler is kind of the star of the show. But really, all the other pieces of equipment are just as important to make sure that the best quality product comes out of the back of that baler. Um, you, usually when we have um, field days and such, I, I, I hear a lot of producers say that if I just had that new baler that they, they're driving out there in the field, I could make better bales. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure one out of 10 cases that may be true, but so much in terms of just bale quality and in terms of density and, and bale shape, it, it's based on the operator and how you're running that piece of equipment rather than the equipment itself. Um, so the two big things that I see are tractor ground speed and PTO speed. We usually need to slow down um, driving across that field uh, in terms of our ground speed and then increasing our PTO speed. And so, you know, that's not to say that you, you can't bail faster with certain balers than others. Um, your, your ground speed is ultimately going to depend on the baler that you have, the horsepower capability of that tractor pulling that baler, the size of your windrow and the moisture of that forage going into the baler. And then, um, the terrain in which you're bailing. Uh, you know, we're fairly fairly flat down here, down in the coastal plains, um, but we don't have perfectly flat fields um, without, you know, bull holes and divots and so on, um, like they would have out in the Midwest. And so we can't just race the baler across the field um, to, to ensure that we get a good shaped bale like you see in these pictures here. So regardless of the equipment you have, whether you have a brand new line of hay equipment or you're using something that's 30, 40 years old, um, we got to keep it clean to maintain. I really like to wash the cutter bar and the, and the conditioner part of my mower after every single use. It, that greatly helps in terms of um, I can see what the problems are in my mower and I can also prevent weeds from being carried from one field to another. Um, we want to use something like an air hose or leaf blower to, to clean off that tether and rake um, before we maintain it, and then to keep our baler as clean as possible inside and out. Um, we want to make sure that we're oil and grazing the equipment according to manufacturer instructions, and then working with our local dealership or product specialist to learn more um, about that specific piece of equipment, um, because they're going to know that equipment better um, than than me is just an extension specialist. And so with that, we can take any questions. Um, like I said, if you have specific questions if you, at this time, if you could put them in that Q&A chat. Um, we did see a, a quick note here um, with slides of, um, of the presentations be provided. Um, we don't have, I haven't discussed that yet, um, if you will send us an email at just georgiaforages at uga.edu um, with which specific slides you need, um, we can work on work with the speakers to get those. All right, it's a quiet group this morning. I'm not seeing any questions pop up. Um, and we do have a defined break time kind of here in the middle as long as we keep moving. Um, and that can be another time that we can um, address some, some, some of the questions in this Q&A set, uh, Q section. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop my screen share and we will invite, um, make sure we've got all our other speakers on here. Uh, we're gonna invite Clay Williams and Sam Ingram next. Um, both work with, um, Corteva AgriSciences and have been great collaborators here with my program and over the past year or so. Um, I, I often get a lot of questions about uh, how we use DuraCore since it is such a new herbicide. And then everybody wants to know about that, that magic clover saving herbicide that we hear 
kind of they're coming through the rumor mill. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to um, Clay and Sam so they can give a, a more official introduction of themselves and start talking about some of their products available. Now, I may be dumb I'm trying to figure out how to take over the screen here. <laughs> All right, so do you see a green share screen button at the bottom? Oh, I'm an idiot. Yep. It's screaming at me. There we go. There we go. Let me get this going here. There you go. Everybody can see it. It's loading up right now. I don't know why it's taking some time. Sam, do you have your screen loaded up? Oh, there we go. Never mind. All right. So thank you all so much for having us. Um, I, I'm Clay Williams. Um, and we'll have Sam on here, but uh, we are uh, we're with Corteva AgriScience. Um, for those that, that don't know of us, uh, we are uh, what used to be DuPont and Dow Chemical. Um, and so uh, we merged together. I think it's been two, three years uh, that we merged together. And so uh, we are now Corteva AgriScience. And so um, if this is a new logo to you, this is, it's, it's two old companies that have come together um, and, uh, and we're, we're making a name for ourselves, uh, the name that we already have. But uh, jumping into it, talk a little bit about myself before we get too far into it. I am, most of you probably already know me. I'm the uh, range and pasture specialist here in Georgia, but I also cover the Carolinas, Virginia, and West Virginia. I was raised in Georgia and Bishop, Georgia, so just south of Athens. Um, uh, but I've been with the company now for uh, seven years. It was with Dow. Um, been in this role, I think, five years now, uh, losing track of time. But uh, I live in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, kind of to be central in my territory. Uh, but that's a little bit about me. Uh, that's my beautiful wife and a piece of our home farm there in uh, Bishop, Georgia. Um, hope to get back there sometime soon. Uh, but before I jump into my con uh, content, I'll let Sam introduce himself. Sam. You're on mute. Sam, we can't hear you. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead. Clay, here we go. All right. Good now. All right. All right. Sorry, sorry, folks. I thought we had this set up, but um, thanks everybody for taking the time today. Wanted to introduce myself as well. You know, um, obviously. This is part of the, the frustrations of Zoom meetings, and I'm very excited to get back to in-person. Um, one of the things Clay just introduced himself, I, I want you all to know who's speaking with you today since we can't be in person. One of the, the things I enjoy the most is the time leading up to these presentations, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks in the room. So what we're trying to do here is just get you to, to feel more comfortable around us as we talk to our, present, our presentations. Uh, so who I am is uh, similar to Clay, raised here in Georgia, uh, in Rome, Georgia, northwest side of the state on a cow-calf operation. Uh, now my dad and my brother just run uh, a hay operation, about 300 acres, predominantly tall fescue. Spent five years as a county agent. Uh, I looked at the participant list. We have county agents from the state of Georgia, I know, and also the state of North Carolina. So spent some time as a county agent here in the state. And now with Corteva, I've been here roughly a year. Uh, I'm located in Savannah. So uh, I'm in the state, but I, I have a wide uh, region. I cover the Eastern US. Uh, bread and butter would be the Southeast, which the majority of the folks on this call would be the Southeast. And uh, Clay, if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about my role with Corteva. So the, the best way to explain it, and sorry, the picture looks a little blurry there, but 
Um, Clay sells the products that we have with Corteva and I research those products um, that, that he's selling. So, you know, we don't just go out there and put a, a jug of herbicide on the, the shelf and walk away from it. We spent uh, countless years researching those products, making sure they have the potential to improve uh, your operation on the farm. Two of them we'll talk about today to pinpoint on are Duracore and Proclova. Um, in addition to that, like Clay said, a lot of you know him already. Um, when, when you come with, to him with technical questions, sometimes he'll reach out to me. So I have that support arm as well to our sales team. That way we're able to give you the best information possible. And Lisa mentioned it briefly on working closely with the universities. We've enjoyed working with Lisa and Jennifer there in Tifton. And, you know, beyond that, we work with a lot of the folks uh, across the Southeast. So, you know, everything that, that we do on the Corteva side, we want to make sure our folks at the universities have exposure to it. They're familiar with it. That way, when we bring a product to market, everybody has good knowledge on it. That way we can get you um, the supportive information you need. Now I'll let Clay jump back into the agenda and dive into Duracor. Yep. So, so that was a little introduction there. Uh, thanks, Sam, for, for introducing yourself. But uh, we'll kind of go through this. Um, I'll cover the front part of this. We'll briefly touch on why I control weeds. Um, I'm sure most of you know the answer to that, but just kind of touch on that briefly. And then I'll give you an update on Duracor. Um, as well as, uh, as talk about um, uh, DFI. But uh, Sam will touch on Pro Clova, and then there at the end. All right, so why control weeds? Um, as we know, whether it's in a grazing or in a hay situation, uh, we see weeds um, displacing a pound to a pound and a half of forages. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, no matter what situation we're in, our, our, our product is grass and we are grass farmers. And so our weeds are our biggest enemy. Um, and then it's also the quality, the quantity and fan longevity uh, that we're, we're trying, to, uh, trying to achieve. So um, with weeds, we're going to see pass grazing and, uh, and see uh, through that we're going to see some stand reduction. Uh, by allowing um, that weed to take over in that area. In grazing situations, we're going to see cattle moving themselves away from those areas as well, and then just allowing that weed to have uh, more influence and, and more competition in that area. Uh, as we said, weeds are often more aggressive, um, reducing that grazing area, and then all of this just goes into a slower or reduction of that forage intake uh, or forage growth in terms of a hay, uh, hay situation. All right, so jumping into uh, Duracor update. So many of you have uh, maybe heard the name Duracor in the past year, two years. Um, so this is a product that we brought onto the market uh, in, uh, into the retail space last year. I think it was uh, January or February of 2020 uh, that we uh, received the label and, and introduced this product to, to you all, this herbicide to you all. Uh, a product uh, that has long been anticipated and we saw great success with. Uh, to give you a rundown for those that may not be familiar with it or maybe uh, haven't had the chance to try it yet. So Duracore is a broadleaf residual herbicide. Um, so it's something that we would use in, uh, on an acre like we would graze on next or graze on P&D or even chaparral. Um, so this is the uh, first product that we've brought to the market, a new product that we brought onto the market in nearly 15 years in the range and pasture, uh, so hay and pasture market. Um, so it's more convenient um, for multiple reasons, one being a lower use rate. So uh, here you see a 12 ounce rate. We'll talk about rates on the next slide, um, but our standard rate is going to be 16 ounces. But when we compare that to some of our other herbicides, this is a lot lower use rate, um, but it also has flexible application methods. Um, so maybe we're fertilizing, uh, going out and trying to fertilize that acre come uh, March. Um, we can actually apply this to our fertilizer, our dry fertilizer, or even apply it with our uh, liquid nitrogen application. Um, and so 
not only can we do it in a broadcast application, but we're able to put it on dry fertilizer. This product has no restrictions. Um, we talk about grazing restrictions. In the state of Georgia, we have um, no haying restrictions there. Um, so an easy to use product when it comes to convenience sake. Uh, we're seeing a broader spectrum of weeds controlled here. So uh, if you've used graze on next in a hay situation, one of your probably biggest weeds that you see in the hay situation is going to be plantain. Uh, and we've seen a lack of control in the past with the, our previous portfolio, our previous technology, Crazy on Next being our most prominent product. But well, we're seeing quite a bit of control uh, improvement there with Duracore. And that's thanks to uh, the addition of Renscore to that, uh, to, that, um, to that jug. And so with Renscore, we're in Duracore, we're seeing great control of plantain. Um, in, in hay fields and in pastures, obviously, but uh, that's one that I would say for, for those that are on this call that you probably are very excited to hear if you haven't seen it yourself. Um, and then peace of mind. So you see here on this slide, it talks about reduced risk herbicide. So we have Renscore and Amino Pyrrolid. That are the two active ingredients that make up Duracore. Many of you are familiar with Amino Pyrrolid, whether it be the use of Grazon Next or Chaparral. Um, and so we see great things with amino pyrrolids, and, uh, and so we're pairing it with Renscore, and that's what's adding uh, our broader spectrum of weeds, but it's also giving us a little more peace of mind. So uh, Renscore is a, is a practically non-volatile herbicide, and we pair that with uh, amino pyrrolid that also is, is a low volatility herbicide. So we get into these hot summer days like we are now going to allow us to go out there and make that application and not be worried about uh, what, may ha what may happen some afternoon um, with, uh, with 95 degree days. A lower odor as well. Some of us are spraying in areas that, uh, that may raise questions or, or start conversations from our neighbors. Or, um, and this is going to give us, you know, not as much of that, what's that smell that uh, 2,4-D often, uh, often brings up. Uh, and then just like many of our other products, this one is extremely safe on grasses. Uh, Bahia, Bermuda, fescue, we're not gonna see any injury to any of our uh, desirable grass species uh, that we may be going over the top of with Duracore. All right, so for those of you that used it last year, um, you may have gone out uh, with a 12 ounce rate. And, um, and that's not to say, as we talk about updating our, our rate range, it's not to say that a 12 ounce rate uh, shouldn't be used anymore. Uh, but we have encouraged uh, many people to increase the use uh, or the use rate of Duracore. Um, where we see 12 ounces fitting is going to be in that well managed pasture or hay situation. Um, so if you're someone that's, that's commonly, you know, every year or even more than one time a year, putting some type of herbicide or fertilizer out on your pasture and hay, uh, hay area, you're probably going to, to see a lot of success with that 12 ounce rate. Um, for those that may be doing once every few years uh, and depending on what weed species you're going after, 16 ounces is probably gonna be a better fit. Uh, we see 16 ounces fitting most situations better than a 12 ounce rate would. Uh, but then again, we're sitting here on this call uh, with a focus on hay, and we know that there's a lot of inputs going into hay and a lot of care going into that. So uh, keep in mind that as we talk about a 16-ounce rate being the standard, that your situation, uh, you, may be, uh, you may be the one that can fit that 12 ounces and see success with. Um, and we'll touch on what we, we shorthand called DFI, dry fertilizer impregnation. Um, when we're talking about that, that's going to be a 20-ounce rate. Um, and then we saw last year, as we got into July and August, and, and some of these situations that hasn't seen a herbicide application then, um, we're talking about pigweed for the most part here, spiny amaranth. When we saw those situations where no application or even no mowing had been done, and we had some three, four foot high pigweed, we needed something to help with that burn down on that pigweed. And that's where we're seeing a pine of 2,4-D really helping just uh, speed up the process of, of controlling that pigweed and getting it down uh, and getting that control. Um, so a pine of 2,4-D with that 16 ounces of, 
uh, of Duracore would be my recommendation when we're talking about a mature stand of pigweed. And that's and, and we can apply that to many other weed species we're seeing that time of the year, but I would say that's your most notable uh your most notable uh species that that we saw that need for so uh we worked with lisa last year and we're very appreciative of uh, of the time that she put into some plots um she did some in a, a lapa hall and some in tifton uh and so we're just going to go through uh some of the plots here and some we did many and i just kind of touched on a few of uh, a few of the reps and so we'll go through and these are actually the ones in a lapa hall uh, and so this is this was the control of a plot, uh, which uh, what we commonly saw. So you see a little bit of everything. See some smart weeds. See some dog fennel. There's a little bit of pigweed, a little bit of horse nettle. Uh, but this was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa, but it was a mostly Bermuda uh, with some bahia in there, uh, but a, mostly a Bermuda stand there in a lap of hall. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so this is your 12 ounce rate, um, and if I remember correctly, we took these pictures. Was this? And I should have I should have uh, gotten this information beforehand. But if I remember correctly, this was 30, 35 days after treatment. Yeah, somewhere between um, 35 and 42 days, depending on which okay. you look at. Yep. Um, so this is the 12 ounce rate. We see good control. Um, we do see some escapes here, but this is 12 ounce rate. Um, in most situ in most grazing situations, I would say this is this is a, a very good uh, control uh, or desirable control. Then we jump to 16 ounces. Um, in 16 ounces, we're not seeing as much uh, escapes. We're off that control side to the right side of the screen. We are seeing some dog fennel. And let me preface this, when we're talking about dog film, Duracore is not something that I would encourage you to do by itself. We saw great control of dog film here, um, but in most cases, I'm going to encourage you to throw some pasture guard in the tank. Eight ounces of pasture guard with 12, 16 ounces of Duracore is going to be a knockout when it comes to dog film control. But we did see great control of dog film here. That being said, so we see 16 ounces, um, we see improved control across all weed species, and we're also getting more amino pyrrolid with this, so maybe a touch more residual um, uh, with that uh, 16 ounces. 20 ounces, we're seeing a touch more. It's very a marginal amount of control, um, but I would say in a hay situation, if we're looking at these three applications, we're seeing that 16 and 20 uh, being a, a cleaner uh, stand for, uh, or a cleaner, um, yeah, cleaner stand of control for a hay situation. That being said, if we're looking at the call from 16 to 20, in this situation, I don't think you're gonna see uh, the, ex the added expense of that 20 ounce rate giving you, at a, in a timely application, uh, giving you the added benefit or at that cost. I think 16 ounces um, in this situation was the greatest, but again, depend, this was an area that hasn't been treated for year after year after year. And so if we go back to where we're talking about rate recommendations, in most of y'all situation where you're taking care of that hay acre, I think 12 ounces would work well there. Um, it's when we start getting into mature weeds and we start seeing some some good heights and, and a stand that has or a stand of grass that hasn't been treated for a while. That's where that 16 ounces and more is going to be beneficial to us. All right, so we talked about DFI, dry fertilizer impregnation already, and I just want to touch on this briefly. Some of you may have already um, done this with Graze on Next, uh, but we have the ability uh, to, to utilize both technologies, Duracore and Grades on Next with this. And this is something that, that we've seen a lot of excitement around uh, and a lot of success around. And so what it is, um, is we're taking Duracore or Grades on Next, either one of them, uh, Duracore at a 20 ounce rate, a full court rate of Grades on Next. And we can use Chaparral, but we focus on Duracore and Grades on Next being liquid herbicides, it's easier on uh, whoever we're buying our uh, fertilizer through or a herbicide through for them to blend that product onto that fertilizer. We're going to see the same spectrum of weeds controlled uh, with a 
with a DFI application than we would a um, than we would a broadcast application. We talked about uh, dog fennel just now, so we do see some controlled dog fennel, not to be trusted, but. I would say in this application, you're not going to see that. You're not going to have as good of a chance to see Dura or, or grades on next controlled dog fennel. Um, but for the most part, we're going to see a similar spectrum of weed control with a DFI application compared to a broadcast application. Um, I would expect the same amount of residual um, out of this. And, and that is, and that's what we're relying on here. Um, we are relying, I'm sorry, I thought that we had a slide. And we are relying on soil uptake. So this is something that we we talked about earlier, Lisa talked about earlier about our short-term drought we have occurring right now. We do need moisture for this application uh, to work. And that's with all herbicide applications, but it's even more critical uh, with this dry fertilizer impregnation because we're relying on that moisture to take the, uh, the herbicide and to incorporate it and to allow it to get into that root zone for soil uptake, root uptake, and allow us to get the expected control that we want on these weeds. Um, so this is something that we encourage um, in the first part of the year, the calendar year. So uh, March probably being the most ideal time uh, for this control. This is not something that we're gonna encourage somebody that's got um, mature weeds. Uh, we're targeting weeds when they're roughly four, six inches in height um, for us to go out and to use this and to have success. But what are the benefits of it? Uh, the benefits are going to be we're, we're doing one application. And so when we talk about one application, that's saving us time and that's saving us uh, the application cost if we're someone that, uh, that's been spraying or paying for someone to spray our pastures. Um, and then we're having fewer weather delays. We talk about the importance of moisture. Um, this is something that, you know, in the past, I, I've gotten many a calls from you all saying, hey, how, how long do I need to wait uh, before it rains? Um, or how, how quickly before it rains can I spray? This is something really and truthfully, we can get out there in a light rain and make that application. If that, if whoever is spraying or spreading our fertilizer is comfortable with that, we can have that a heavy dew in the morning. It's a time that we typically have avoided spraying. This is a time that we can get out there and spread that fertilizer and allow that moisture to help bring that, uh, those prills and incorporate them and, and get that root uptake occurring a little quicker than we, uh, than we hope. And then we have the reduced risk of drift, whether it be next to a neighborhood, next to grandma's garden, whether it be next to some sensitive crops. We always had that concern of what we're next to when we're spraying. Through this application, we don't have that worry uh, of, of what's next door. We're, we're going to see those prills drop and we're not going to have that worry of that drift getting over into an area that we don't want it to be. And so obviously no spray equipment needed, a spreader truck or spreader buggy is all that's needed. And so if that's spreader buggies, there's some opportunities for you to make this application yourself, depending on, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, but it's also gonna allow us, as we talk about large and small operations, it's gonna allow us to get into some areas that maybe we couldn't um, in the past, whether it be a tight little area, or maybe it's a wood-lined area that a boom sprayer just couldn't get into, or maybe it's some rolling ground uh, that a boom, just uh, a sprayer just couldn't get into. So, we can get a spreader truck or a spreader buggy over this ground a lot easier than a spray truck could. Um, so it's going to allow us to get into some areas that, uh, that previously had been hard to control the weeds. Uh, but we're also going to see the benefit of that uh, fertilizer as well in there. And so allow us to, to really improve our acreage uh, and maybe get into some areas that, that, uh, that we have historically ignored. With that, we can answer questions at the end, but I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Sam. Sam, do you want to take over the screen, or do you want me to just continue to click along? Yeah, I think we could probably just let you uh, roll through them. I think that'll All work right. okay. We can go on to the next one here. So, um, thanks, Clay. Thanks for that update on Duracore. Now we're going to focus over on on Pro Clover and Clay. If you want to move to the next slide. Uh, as Lisa said, you know, we've had a, a lot of questions around this. This this pump has been primed for sure. We we know that it's one that we're really excited about, Pro Clova. Um, a lot of folks have had experiences with it on our university side. They're excited about the, the potential of this product. And uh, as are we. I'll go ahead and say, you know, we don't have, I'm, I've never been good at speculation. Um, 
you can look at my TD Ameritrade stock account and uh, I'm forward <laughs> speculating. So I, I don't want to speculate on a timeline for release, uh, but I do feel like in the near future, we're going to have that option out there for you all. So I want to go ahead and address that because I know that is a question we get often. Um, and this being a good clover year, you know, spending time out in the pastures and hay fields with folks, it has been a jam up clover year for a lot of people. And um, we want to have this technology out there for you all uh, that have that mixed sword or, or pure clover stands. So let's dive in and talk about what ProClova is. It is a, a herbicide we're anticipating res registration on that will preserve white clover and annual lespedeza in our hay fields and pastures. And that first bullet point is a big one for us. We need to focus in on, on this one and, and understand that it is just registered currently for white clover or what we're looking for registration on is white clover and annual lespedeza. That is not to say we are, we are constantly looking at other legumes, other clovers, but we are, we are focusing in here on white clover and annual lespedeza. The second bullet point is talking about no soil residual activity. Clay just talked about the benefits of Duracor with amino pyrrolid giving us soil residual activity. All right, that, that, that is a piece of the puzzle. That is a tool in your toolbox there. With this part, we're, we're pulling out that residual activity. Um, so we don't have, uh, we have more flexibility as you see here with a plant back interval, roughly 15 days on that. Um, where we don't need that residual, this, is, this will be a herbicide that would be desired. Uh, the conversation that you may have with some of the, the folks that purchase your hay, you won't have to have that conversation on composting. Krista asked a question in the chat, uh, does Duracor have the same restrictions as Grazon Next? Yes, it does because of the amino pyrrolid. When we're talking about Proclova, we don't have to have that conversation, okay? Um, and going down through those bullet points, similarly, no grazing restrictions on our, our livestock, minimal hay restrictions there. Big picture, or the big takeaways from this one, it's a white clover and annual lespedes that, that we're focusing in on. All right, Clay, if you want to move to the, to the next one, we'll talk about expected use rates and, and, and where we see this fitting. So with ProClova, what we've looked at and, and figured out here is we're going to be at a 24 ounce rate on this. That's going to be our primary recommendation with the anticipation of being able to apply uh, up to 48 ounces on that acre of land in a year. So in theory, you can have two split applications of a 24 and a 24. And we're talking about white clover and annual lespedes of preserving those two. But the way I see it as another tool in your toolbox. Clay just talked about Duracore with uh, this powered by Renscore and Amino Pyrrolid. Now, obviously, we have a, a certain amount of Amino Pyrrolid we can put out in a year. Uh, maybe we want to hold on to that residual herbicide uh, for later and we want to keep it in our back pocket. You know, beyond just preserving our white clover and annual Lespedeza. I see this as another non-residual option you have um, in your toolbox to go out, maybe clean up your fields early on, and then maybe using that, uh, that Duracore label with the amino pyrrolid to get you some residual throughout the year. So in addition to preserving our white clover and annual espadiza, I think we have another good non-residual option. With, with ProClova, we're going to need an adjuvant, specifically methylated seed oil. And that'll be at a 1% 1, 1 volume per volume for our best results. We need that methylated seed oil um, for this formulation to be effective. That's one of the things that, that we're keying in on as we're anticipating registration, working with our retailers, working with our universities and the end user to make sure that we have that in there for, for, um, for our best results. Go ahead if you want to move to the next one. And I know this, these slides are pretty busy. Don't worry, I'm, I'm going to get to more of the, the pictures here. I'm a visual person. I think most folks uh, appreciate visuals. So we do have a, a good many of those with applications we've made 
here in Georgia. But let's talk about the preservation of, pro, uh, of, of white clover, specifically with pro clover. And, and I say preserved because we do see some yellowing, some lodging that clover laying down uh, after application. But as we go further away from that application, the clover kind of bounces back. I'll walk you through a timeline there. But that is an expectation we want to set up front is um, when we make an application on this white clover, we will see some lodging, we will see some yelling, but that clover bounces back. Let's move to the next one, Clay, and walk through that timeline on that. So hopefully this picture, it looks a little blurry on my screen. Hopefully we can have a little more clarity possibly uh, on everybody else's. So if we look on the top left, this is day of application on a pure white clover stand. So to set the stage, majority of folks on this call are not gonna have a pure white clover stand. So we're looking at uh, quote unquote, a worst case scenario with pure clover. A lot of time that sward is gonna be mixed, tall fescue, white clover, some of our other species. So it's not gonna be as, uh, it's not gonna look as bad as, as what we're looking at here. But this, I wanna set the expectations of, of what we'll see uh, when we make that application. So top left is day of application, 24 ounce rate with a 1% MSO. We move to our right, we're looking at one week. We can see that clover, I apologize for the blurriness, but uh, we can see that clover laying over some yellowing. Move down uh, on our left-hand side to two weeks after application. This is really where we have that, what we, we say is the low point about 14 days after application, we really see that that's gonna be our lowest point of the clover. Um, and we know that there might be some heartburn if we don't set expectations on the front end of this. So this would be uh, what we would expect at two weeks. But as we move over to three weeks, we can see that clover rebounding, coming back up, getting some uh, green, move out to four and five, go all the way to five weeks, our bloom has come back, that clover um, comes back and we preserve it. This is after a 24 ounce rate. Obviously we're just looking at, in this situation, we're just looking at the crop tolerance. Clay, if you wanna to move to the next one, we'll look at a more of a, a real world scenario uh, with one of our field demonstrations that, that Clay has set up and he took the lead here outside of Griffin. We're looking at, this is an aerial shot we had. Um, this is eight days after application, that's the eight DAA on a mixed sort of tall fescue and white clover and our predominant weed species. Tough to really pick out here. Clay, pick that uh, hit one more with the animation, yeah. Predominant weed species here was buttercup. So on our left-hand side, you can still see the yellow blooms of the buttercup. Right-hand side, that would be our application of pro clova at a 24 ounce rate. Um, if we move down into the sward, uh, Clay, if you'll move to that next slide, we can look at this uh, on the ground so that we just turn from east to west. And you can see on the ground here on our left-hand side would be the treated, on our right-hand side would be untreated. This was earlier this spring on mature buttercup. And you can see just after eight days, we have really taken down that plant. And as we get deeper into the sward, Clay, on the next slide, we can see some of that lodging, some of that, uh, not the yellowing so much yet. We're not at the, what we call the bottom point, but um, you can see both here in, with that white clover laying down also with a buttercup too. Um, it's not gonna be as pronounced in a mixed fescue stand, mixed fescue white clover stand, which is what we had here, which is what we are pre predominantly going to see in the Southeast with a tall fescue white clover mix. Um, we don't have follow-up pictures here. I haven't been back by that site. But as, as you could see from the earlier slides, I would imagine that clover is picked back up um, with a good control on that tall, on that buttercup, that tall buttercup uh, with a clover being preserved. So one of the things we're really excited about there with, with pro clover. Want to stop there and, and take some questions if we have them. I know Lisa was talking about putting them in the chat. I think that's going to be our best thing. If not, we can we can hold those till the end. Um, again, this is one that a lot of folks are excited about. We're excited about too. One of the things I talked about working with our universities 
We've gotten ProClova in our, in our university cooperators hands. So they have experience with it. Many county agents on this call, when folks are asking about that, I know our county agents call on their, their state extension specialist. We want them to, to have personal experience with it too. No, we're anticipating registration on it and we're ready to, to get this product in the hands of, of the end user for sure. All right, thank you guys. Um, if, um, if, if, all right, there we go. Um, if you would put your um, questions in that Q&A box, um, we, the way the Zoom webinar is set up is all participants are muted um, so that we can help prevent feedback and stuff. Um, so yeah, if you will drop your questions in that Q&A box for either uh, Clay Williams or Sam Ingram. Like you said, Lisa, a real chatty bunch this morning. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a quiet group. Um, we do have a time scheduled for a break. And so if you all think of questions while we're um, at break, feel free, drop them in the chat box uh, and, and we'll address them via the chat or um, live when we come back. Um, I, okay, so the guys, I do see one question in there. Um, if you want to go ahead and answer that. Um, if anybody does want to step away for a break, um, we will be back here at about 1025 to start the next presentation. Uh, so yeah. Dur Duracore works extremely well on plantain. Um, I, I would hit it primarily on plantain um, before that seed head emerges. That's not to say you can't uh, get control of it when that seed head uh, has emerged. Uh, but we're going to have better success um, in probably the latest March, first part of April, um, but going on into the season, especially if we're trying to go after plantain between cuttings, we do want some leaf area uh, before we make that application. But I would say anywhere from that 12 to 16 ounce rate of Duracore, you'll see good control on plantain. All right, thank you all again. If you all have questions, feel free to drop them in that chat box and we'll start back with uh, Jason Belcher's presentation at 1025.
All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started back. Um, I know there were a couple questions that popped up in that Q&A box. Um, and so if you, content, if you ha do have any questions about the previous presentations or the upcoming two, definitely drop those in that Q&A box and we'll get those answered either via the, the chat or live. Um, so next up, we have Jason Belcher with, um, with Bayer. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with him over probably the past two years now. Um, on, on Resilon and, and using it in different forage systems here in the South Georgia area. And so we'll turn it over to Jason now. All right, thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, as Lisa said, I'm Jason Belcher. I'm the uh, Eastern U.S. Stewardship Development Manager for Bayer. Um, I cover vegetation management, forestry, and range and pasture, so a pretty wide swath. Um, pretty much from the southern tip of Florida. Well, they tell me I, I'm in Puerto Rico also, but um, all the way up to uh, the Canadian border. So quite a bit of ground I cover, but a little background on me. Uh, I spent the early part of my career, 18 years or so at Auburn University doing uh, weed science research uh, on herbicides, ranging from row crops to um, vegetable crops, methyl bromide alternatives, and range of pasture and vegetation management. So uh, quite a varied background. Um, I kind of been like a rock skipping across the water, so to speak. So um, I left Auburn in 2012 and went to DuPont, uh, which was prior to Corteva, one of those uh, companies, and uh, started there in 2012, uh, conducting herbicide research with VM. And then in 2014, our group was sold over to, uh, to Bayer. Um, uh, and I've been there ever since. And so, uh, and also, if you have not heard, um, our group now is also, which is uh, an environmental science in Bayer. Um, Bayer is going to retain their crop science side, but the environmental science side, which contains our group, as well as turf and ornamentals and professional pest control, will be uh, divested off to somebody. So if you've got deep pockets, um, we'll be happy to entertain any any uh, buyers. So with that said, I'm going to um, introduce or, or maybe uh, just talk a little bit about Resilon. Uh, it's a, our, a newest product in range and pasture. Um, and we just uh, got it out at the end of last year after working with it since about 2016 uh, in, in this area. So with that, uh, I will try and advance my slides here. So what is Resilon? Uh, the active ingredient in Resilon is in Dazaflam. Uh, it is a pre-emergence herbicide. Uh, we refer to it as a CBI or a cellulose biosynthesis inhibitor, which basically means it, it prevents uh, the formation of cellulose in those root walls especially. It's a group 29, and uh, if you pay attention to resistance, that's important uh, because really I think um, Prowl is the only other labeled pre now, I believe, in this group other than Diuron. And so uh, it does help with the resistance management. Uh, in other areas that we've got in Dazaflam labeled, uh, it has really become the, the premier pre emergent herbicide of choice. Um, it, it's very effective at low use rates, a long residual. Um, we've got a non crop site such as railroads roadsides and that type of thing, also forestry, uh, pecans, blueberries, citrus, and then uh, the turf and ornamental industry as well. So quite a lot of uh, markets to see in. Uh, I will say in my career, and I would say this, in fact, I did say this when I was at DuPont talking to some of the marketing folks there, that it's probably the best herbicide, at least from a pre-emergent standpoint, that I've ever worked with um, for a variety of reasons. So uh, it certainly has, has changed a lot of the landscapes uh, that it's gone into. So um, while Resilon does have pre emergent activity on both broadleaf and grass species, we, I really want to focus on uh, the annual grass control in our range of pasture market. Um, you know, as, uh, as many of you know, we have a lot of broadleaf herbicides available for use in, in range and pasture, but not so much um, those that target the, the annual grasses or perennial grasses. Um, you know, as you think, it's it's easy to control a broadleaf in a grass, but not so easy to control a grass in a grass crop. So um, with that, we uh, are targeting Bermuda grass and Mahia grass primarily. Uh, we've shown safety on numerous warm season uh, species, but again, those are the main two that we see in range and pasture settings. And so that's what we specifically put on the label. Um, it is not allowed to be used on cool season grasses, such as tall fescue especially. Um, some of the early work we did, uh, we did see quite a bit of injury on tall fescue, and so we did not label it there. Um, we're going back and taking a look at that, um, kind of trying to tweak it a little bit, also looking at orchard grass and timothy as, a, as well as a couple of others. 
looking at timings to see if we might be able to get it in that market. But uh, for now, it's just on the warm season grasses. And our primary targets are we're going to shoot for uh, wintertime grasses are going to be ryegrass, little barley. Um, the summer is going to be crabgrass, goosegrass, um, especially the foxtails and the sandbur. And so those are, those are the ones that we're going to be after. Some of the attributes of Reslon is that it can sit on the, on the surface of the soil for several weeks with no impact on control uh, while it waits on that rainfall. It's not photodegraded. If you know Prowl uh, very well, you know that if you leave it out there a few days, the sunlight will degrade it uh, if it doesn't get rained on. And so you lose some control. And we don't have that with Reslon. Uh, but uh, like any pre, we do need rainfall or irrigation to get it activated, a uh, quarter to a half inch. Again, that's depending on if it's, you know, if it's dry, I tend to favor, you know, the higher amount needed. Uh, if you've got moist soil conditions, we don't need quite as much. So, um, you know, it really depends on what, what your uh, soil moisture conditions are. Uh, and I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, we released it last year in August, and uh, we had quite a few people target ryegrass. Um, got it out without fail almost uh, entirely. All the complaints I've walked uh, in Alabama have been because they put it out towards the end of September. Last fall, especially in the southeast, um, we were moist. We were fairly cool and cloudy, and we had uh, ryegrass germinating fairly early in the season. I have pictures of two-inch tall ryegrass here in Auburn. Um, I believe it was September 21st when I had that picture. So it had started germinating well before that. Um, and so Reslon really has to get out there and get that rainfall or irrigation on it before that seed starts to germinate. Um, you know, these light rainfalls that we get, again, talking about dry conditions, um, I've seen this several times, is we may get a light rainfall, not really be enough to get Reslon in the ground, but it's enough to germinate those seeds as they're sitting in that little organic matter on the surface. And so, um, you know, a little bit more rainfall may be needed in those situations. And so a good rule of thumb in the southeast, and again, this is going to be vary between Arkansas or if you're in the Panhandle of Florida, but generally if you get it out before Valentine's Day and before Labor Day, you're going to be okay on, on the weeds, depending on which ones you cover. And the reason we say that we want you to get it out there early uh, is because Reslon works on that seed as it's germinating. So uh, in this graphic, this is really where you want to have it down as it, before those seeds germinate. And once we get here, and you start getting those root development, especially if you start over into this stage and you get your resin down, even if you get a good rainfall, you've got roots now growing below the level of uh, incorporation that and dad's plant is going to get into that soil. So while you might get a little root pruning and a root dieback, um, many times I've seen uh, it go on at a marginal timing and you'll have a crabgrass or ryegrass come up and they've got one or two little roots that manage to survive and it's sustaining that plant as long as it's getting rainfall. Um, now, I've, I've had uh, crabgrass that I have gone out and pulled up with no roots, and it's been fine in, you know, early May, but by mid-June, rainfall starts to cut off, it gets dry, and they usually die off, but when you get into these stages here, you really need to have a tank mix partner with it. Um, you know, something that's, that's soil active would be preferable because, again, you know, for example, if you tank mix with Roundup in this stage, where you might get a few that are emerging, but you still got a lot that haven't broken the surface yet, uh, and so having something that a little bit more soil activity um, would be beneficial. So the use rates are three to five ounces in a single application and no more than six fluid ounces in a 12 month period. Um, in situations, again, as I just pointed out, when you've got seeds up uh, or, or things germinated already, putting in Roundup or Pastor, depending on your species, Cimarron Plus, certainly as, as uh, Clay and Sam had, well, Grazon would be a good option because that amino pyrrolid in there does have root uptake, um, would be beneficial. And so we do want you to include something in there if you're getting out a little bit of that, that um, you know, the questionable timing on it. So generally, if you're, look, if you're just starting out um, in say the spring of the year, uh, we want you to get out there again before um, about February 14th, looking at, you know, targeting those annual summer weeds, uh, grasses such as crabgrass and foxtails, get that three to five ounces out there. Uh, if you're starting a program in the fall of the year, you know, that August or early September, Timing is usually pretty good. Um, again, last year was kind of an anomaly for us in the southeast in that, you know, September and October are generally hot and dry for us down here, but last year it was not. So, uh, but again, I think if you get it out in August to, before the first of September, you're going to be fine. And then if you get on a program, which is really what we recommend, and I say that not to sell more herbicide, um, but because consistently whenever we have that split application of three ounces followed by another three ounces, it has been the most consistent at, at keeping your fields weed-free um, throughout the year. And so that's really what we, we like for our uh, producers to do. 
Now talking about weeds, um, I, I'll talk about perennial persistent weeds because Resline is a pre-only. It, it really doesn't have much post-activity to speak of. And so any species that is a perennial, such as daisy grass or Dallas grass, it's not going to control that, that existing plant. But two of the species that um, I have gotten the most complaints on are not root foxtail, which is a perennial, and many people go out and look and see it, and they think it's a, a yellow foxtail because a lot of them don't know about not root. Or they go out and see sandbur, and um, and this was something that was new to me. I have to be honest. Um, I knew it existed, but I didn't know the extent. Um, but sandbur is that's persisting from one year to the next. Um, and you know, we we might as well call it perennial because you know, some of these plants I'm, I'm thinking have been there for several years. But I'll show some pictures of that as we go forward. On the knot root foxtail, uh, if you look at the picture on the left here, if you just walk out and you see these seed heads, you're going to say, well, I've got yellow foxtail or green foxtail, um, you know, depending on your level of taxonomic ability and uh, you'll tell what it is. But you're just going to know you're a foxtail. And if you have resin out there and you see this, you're not going to be happy with that because you're going to think it missed. Well, if you dig some of these up, and, and I, I would just about bet if you've got foxtail in your field, this is going to be this perennial knot root foxtail. Dig it up. This is actually a robust specimen. Um, the rhizomes here may not be quite as robust on a plant you dig up, but you will be able to tell that that clump has rhizomes when you dig it up. And that will be a perennial and resolon will not control it when it's coming back from this rhizome. Um, we do control not root foxtail and yellow foxtail from seed, but not when you're coming back from these clumps. So if you walk out there in, in April and you see a clump like this, that's not coming from seed. That's coming from a, a, a rhizome. And so it's a good indication that you've got that perennial species there. Uh, you take a little shovel or something, dig that up. You may just be able to pull it, pull it out, depending on how loose the soil is, and, uh, and look for those little rhizomes to, to see if that's what you're dealing with. Um, and you're going to need to include round for pastora in there. I will say pastora is not the best uh, on this during the growing season, nor is Roundup. Um, I have had good success with going out and Roundup in the fall with about 10 ounces. I'm continuing to do that work so that we can have some recommendations for this. Um, but for now, I think if you go into end season, pastor is your best bet because it will reduce your seed heads, although it's, it's only going to give you about 60% control of the plant. So, uh, again, very difficult to control. Now, as far as sandbur goes, we don't deal with this quite as much here in the southeast um, as our friends out in Texas and Oklahoma do. Um, typically here, it's an annual species. Um, we have gotten pretty good results on that, and I'll give you some of the data here in just a moment. But um, you know, everyone knows what the sandbar looks like and certainly don't want that in your hay crop or in your pasture uh, that's being grazed. Uh, but a couple of years ago, our research scientist at uh, one of our stations in North Carolina went out to uh, stake a plow. I believe it was February 30, went out and he noticed some of the plants had, the, had a little green stem at the bottom of it. And uh, so digging some of these up, he found root systems that were still actively growing. They were nice and white. Um, and so they were persisting from one year to the next. Um, we knew that's we knew there was some uh, perennial sandbur out there or persistent sandbur, but it wasn't until we released Resline last year um, and it, people started putting out this uh, January and February for um, control that we realized how much the extent of the problem is. So this was a picture sent to me uh, by one of our range of pasture specialists in Texas. This was taken in April, and uh, obviously that plant did not come from seed when germinating in March or so. Um, that plant has been there for quite some time, and our specialists out there in, in Texas and Oklahoma, it is so bad now that they assume every sandbur complaint they go to, it's perennial sandbur. Uh, it's a very widespread problem, and in talking with some of our scientists out there, uh, my counterpart in Texas, we don't believe that even Texas a and realizes the extent of the uh, perennial sandbur problem they have. So, again, thankfully, we don't have quite this bad of a situation here, but um, it is something to be aware of that uh, when using Resline, you're not going to be able to control these plants that are going from year to year. So considerations on using Resline, there aren't any grazing restrictions at all when you use it. Um, if you use more than a three ounce rate, uh, there is a 40 day harvesting restriction. Now, generally speaking, if you're using more than three ounces, if say you put out four or five, that's going to be, you know, in that February timing. And so you're not going to be cutting hay until probably May, uh, Anyway, so that 40 day restriction really isn't going to, I think, pose much of a problem for anyone. We recommend that you use um, flat fan type nozzles or something similar when you put this out at a volume of at least 15 gallons per acre just to get good soil coverage. Uh, we have seen them go down to eight or 10 um, without too much of an issue, but really, again, it depends on the type of spray that you're using. 
Uh, we don't recommend boomer sprays at this time. We're doing some work on that to see what we may be able to work with. Um, flood jet type nozzles also may be a problem, but we're, again, we're gonna work on that. So for the time being, I think um, just keep in mind, as long as you're getting good soil coverage, you're gonna be okay. But if you start to use bigger droplets and your pattern may not be as good as you would like it, um, we, we encourage you to you know, use a different system for spraying. All right, there is an 18 month restriction on planting cool season grasses, such as ryegrass, which a lot of people do for winter grazing and a 22 month plant back restriction for other crops. Um, as I said at the beginning, it is a very long uh, residual herbicide. And so uh, you're not gonna be able to use it and then come back and plant. And I do have some pictures kind of showing that um, later on. Because it, uh, it is such a low use rate, you always wanna be sure and wash your tank out very well. I recommend triple rinsing and using a cleaning agent for most of the work I do for my small plot work, or even if I'm spraying a 30 gallon tank uh, in larger demo size plots, I'll use ammonia. Just, just mix it in there and wash it out and, and it does a fine job. Uh, it's important to remember whenever you're mixing Resilon in with other things to do the correct mixing order. Um, you can you go online and look at the Wales method, but basically that's telling you to put your, your water dispersible granules, your dry products in first, get it agitated, get those, get those little granules broken up. Then come in with something like Resilon. Um, and then of course later you would put in a surfactant if you needed, if you had a post product in there. Now we have had some issues, and especially some of our other markets, when we've been mixing with Roundup. Uh, and typically it's whenever people put the Roundup or other glyphosate formulation in the tank. And it's because a lot of these now have additives in there or adjuvants already mixed in. And when you put that in first and then put the Resilon in second, um, it does not allow that uh, capsule, that micro capsule to break apart very well. And so uh, we do recommend you put it in first before any Roundup, just you know, for the purposes of uh, the, the mixing order being correct. As I said, resistance management, um, you know, we don't fight it too much in, in our hay fields and pastures very much, but um, it is coming in, especially with the ryegrass, becoming roundup resistant um, and issue resistant. So uh, I think it does give us another, uh, another good option with having Resilon here, but we do encourage tank mixing, um, you know, every other, every third year or something along those lines, but uh, using Prowl H2 in, in conjunction with Resilon. Um, also, if you notice any escape, something that, that comes through and you know your timing was right and you see that, that plant escaping, come back with Pastor or Roundup or something to control those plants that come out uh, of those pre-applications. The states we're currently labeled in, labeled for use in, are in blue here. Uh, we're looking at possibly adding uh, Virginia, maybe Missouri, the boot of Missouri there, just because there is some Bermuda grass there and, and some of these transition areas. Um, but again, we really don't want to encourage use on cool season grasses at this point, just because of the, the injury issues that um, I already talked about. So now getting into some pictures, I think this is what I like to talk about the most. I think it, it shows, uh, you know, the purposes of why we do research, Sam talked about earlier. Uh, this is one of Dr. Baxter's demos that she did for us. And you can see the strip down the middle there sprayed with Resilon uh, a couple of years ago. So a lot of the early work we did was on ryegrass. Um, this was actually one of my small plot trials that I did on ryegrass. And again, early on, um, working in somebody's hay field, you try not to take up too much of their area because again, they can't harvest it because it wasn't a labeled product. So. Uh, these are smaller plots, but again, you can see the how effective Resilon is um, at controlling ryegrass in the top picture compared to four quarts of Prowl uh, put out basically at the same time. Um, the application was in October, but again, this is a dry year in 2017 when I put it out. So uh, no rainfall, really, it was just dry as a bone. So we, we had plenty of time when we got it out there. But again, um, do encourage going out earlier than that most of the time, certainly. Goosegrass uh, is probably one of the most sensitive species, uh, warm season species to Resilon. Um, untreated plot on the left, uh, everything you see here, this is pretty much all goosegrass seed heads. It was just a, a mat of goosegrass. And then everything over here is just, a, it's nice, it's very clean. You can see a little goosegrass over here outside of the plots, but uh, for the most part, we've got 100% control of the goosegrass here. Now the foxtail, again, that's a, that's a key species, I think anywhere you're growing Bermuda grass or even Bahia grass. Um, on the left side of the slides is Dr. Ron Strahan's work he did last year amidst uh, the pandemic. He was able to get out and get some work done. Uh, the farmer told him he had a good stand of Bermuda there, but uh, as you can see, these, these uh, uh, applications went out with a quarter of Roundup uh, just to control the weeds and the ryegrass that was there. And you can see he didn't really have a good stand of Bermuda grass uh, present. But 
with that said, it did have a really good stand of uh, yellow foxtail. And so Dr. Strahan took these pictures in April. This was a February application. You can see um, the exposure is a little bit less here than in the right picture. But you can see all this light green is the ceiling annual foxtail coming up and the three ounces over here, uh, very clean. And then some work that Dr. Russell did while he was uh, working at Mississippi State before he came to Auburn. Um, this was two and a half ounces of Reslon uh, put out. And this was actually midsummer when he took when I took this picture or he took the picture. And you can see basically non-treated area, how much fox sales over here and how clean this is um, in the Resolon plot. So again, we do a good job on the annual fox tails, but again, you just always have to make sure, um, make sure you don't have, um, you know, the perennial fox tail there. Question, will it control Dallas grass in Bermuda? We're, we've actually got work going out this year. It will not control it post-emergence. So if you've got clumps there, um, it will not control those clumps, but we have seen in some of the demo work we've done um, reduced numbers of Dallas grass plants at the end of the season where Resolon was put down compared to untreated or compared to prowl. And so we do believe that we are getting control of Basie and Dallas grass from seed, but I can't say for sure until we get the work in. Uh, we've got several uh, uh, universities working with us this year to answer that question. So, uh, but I do believe we are getting some control of those species. And, Generally speaking, the bigger the seed gets, the less resolon is going to be effective on it, just because that seed is able to come up uh, from deeper in the ground and, and below that in Dazaflam and Corporation level. So hopefully I have a question, I have an answer for you next year. Um, hopefully when Lisa has me on again, if she does. On Sandburr, um, again, this is the biggie here. This is in Alabama, so one of my cooperators here. And again, I apologize for how the slide was set up. He didn't send me the picture, so I just had to take screenshots of his uh, the PDF file he sent me, but this was actually put in on the edge of a, of a uh, pine plantation between it and the cotton field. Sometimes when we do re weed research, uh, we're forced to put it where the weed is, and sometimes we don't always have the, the crop there that we're looking at. So this was on the edge of the cotton field, but you can see he's rating it. He said incidents, but basically about 31% cover here of, uh, of sand burr, but you can see all the seed heads here in this picture. We also had a good bit of tropic croat in there uh, as well. So looking at prowl, the split application of prowl, uh, we put two ounces at two quarts out in February and then came back after the farmer next door to us started cutting his field. And so after he cut it, we said that's, you know, that, and that would be the time we would want you to put Reslon down. And so he put it out and you can see we reduced it maybe about eight or nine percent here at 23, but you can still see all the seed heads in his plot here and a good bit of tropic croton as well. So uh, not a very good job at all for the prowl. And also, if you have a good eye, you can see the cotton plants where he actually went through some of his plots with the edge of his planter. So such is the way of weed science research. But we look at Reslon, um, the sway application Reslon, we actually got really good control. We weren't 100%. Uh, we, we still had a little bit of sand burr occurring in the plot, but very clean, um, except for the croton. And, and we know just from prior experience working with Reslon, as well as in Dazaflam and other markets that we do not control the croton species. So woolly croton, tropic croton, we don't do a very good job on it all. And so you, again, you'll need that, that broadleaf material in there to help with that. As far as tolerance goes, we had uh, quite a few trials out looking at tolerance. And uh, you'll notice on the graph here, we went from two and a half up to 15 ounces of Reslon per acre. Um, Dr. Tim Gray at University of Georgia, uh, myself, as well as some others did some of these yield trials. And really across the board, and you see a little bit of up and down, but for the most part, we really didn't see any differences um, in our yields uh, across years or across um, the trials within a year. So Thomas was very good. Most of these trials were done in relatively weed-free pastures. And so you really didn't have a, a weed effect um, in our yields as you would see in, in other cases when weeds would be present. Now, I referred earlier to uh, overseeding, and I just have this in here to show you how effective uh, Reslon is. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, this is a fall uh, 2017 application of Reslon, and you can see how much ryegrass is in this plot. And here is a spring of 2018. Um, so this is a fall spring application, spring of 2018 application, and the pictures were taken in October of 2018. So basically these pictures um, were taken one year before, or excuse me, the application went out one year before these pictures were taken. So you can see a year out, we, we have ryegrass coming back in these plots that were sprayed the previous fall, but when we put out in the spring of 2018, the ryegrass was still controlled in the fall of 2018. So you're not gonna be able to put it out in the spring and then come back with ryegrass um, or some other winter grazing in the fall. 
Um, there may be some questions about uh, clover. We've gotten that and actually we have worked out this year. Indications are that some of the clovers are gonna be fairly tolerant of it. Um, but again, you know, we're waiting to get the data back to make a recommendation on that. So uh, as far as tolerance and control of weeds, everything we've done with it has been really good. Uh, I think we have a good handle on what we do and don't control. Um, you know, we didn't really have any impact on the yields. And so uh, again, I think those of you that have not used it or have used it, you know, I'd be interested to hear your comments back. Um, you know, again, we have complaints, I think with everything, you come out with a new product and I'm sure Sam and Clay would agree with this. You really don't know what it's gonna do until you get it in the hands of the end user and you have thousands of people putting it out in real world situations that you find out, you know, what the little things are that you missed or, you know, how you may have to tweak your recommendation. So that's what we're in the process of doing now. Um, and hopefully as we go forward, we'll, we'll just have better and better recommendations for how to use it. It's a couple other points. Um, Sam and Clay both talked about this and theirs about the importance of weed control. Um, this was one of the early demonstrations I did. I did it actually headed out last year. Uh, the farmer I was with, he sprayed the entire field with Prowl. Um, you know, and I said, well, I'd like for you to look at some res line on some of your plots. We'd like to do a video and show. So I said, I don't think the prowl is going to do very well. And again, I'm not trying to bash prowl. I'm just talking from a, you know, my experience and a scientific standpoint. So he came back and he put three ounces of res line over some of the field and left prowl alone on others. So the foreground here, this is all crabgrass uh, where the prowl went down. This is three quarts of prowl applied in February. This is three ounces of Roundup applied um, a few days after he put his prowl application out. And you can see the difference in how much progress is in this area and this. The other picture I took was after he took his first um, harvest off. And you can see the difference. This was all where the crabgrass was. This is where Reslon was put down and, and controlled the crabgrass. So, you know, when they were talking earlier about controlling weeds, I mean, you know, you look at this and you tell me what which area do you think is gonna be able to be cut faster on the next cutting? Uh, and it just shows you the amount that weeds in your pastures and your hay fields will depress the growth, take up the nutrients and water uh, of that Remuda grass. So um, it certainly certainly is beneficial to have herbicides in your program. Then finally, um, Resilon will tell on you um, whenever you get it out. If you get it out in a timely manner, control your weeds. If you don't overlap well, um, it's gonna tell on you every time. And this is a farm on the left. This is uh, some ryegrass and a little barley. You can see where he skipped over a little bit far with the sprayer and, and missed a swath there. And, um, and this is a farmer here. He missed a swath about a foot wide. Not too bad for uh, not using a GPS or anything, uh, just eyeballing. But he missed about a foot wide swath across his field. And he did that on about every pass. So, um, you know, it's a learning lesson, but it will tell on you uh, when you don't, don't overlap well. So, with that, I believe that winds it up. Uh, there's my email. If uh, anybody ever have any questions, wants to contact me. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I, I love talking about hay production. I grew up doing it, so um, it's in my blood. So if anybody has any questions, put them in the chat box. Um, we'll try and get to them. And uh, if not, I guess we can move on and, and then answer any questions you might have at the, at the end of the session. Great, thank you, Jason. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to drop them down there in that chat box um, and we can continue to answer those throughout the next presentation if needed. Um, and when we have time at the end to circle back to ans answer any questions live um, as we need to. Um, our last presentation today, um, and I encourage you don't, don't jump off right as, as BJ ends here because um, we do have a survey for everybody to fill out, please. Um, but our, our last speaker is B.J. Marks, who is a, a fantastic hay and baleage producer up in the middle part of the state. He gave a great presentation at the American Forage Grassland Conference in Savannah, Georgia, back in January. Um, and it's a lot of great information in here. And so I invited him back um, again. So if you give me just a moment to, to share my screen with his presentation, um, and then B.J. is going to jump on live here to, to talk through these pictures, because um, I think every slide is a picture. So. So it's a nice break from the traditional presentations that, that we like to give. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So when Lisa asked me to come and talk about this, I said, sure. I said, you know, I, I love forage. I'd be glad to come. Um, when you look at the picture out there, there's a lot of heritage there. I'm going to give you a little backstory about us. We, uh, 
my dad, my father, my, my father and myself are in business together. We, uh, several years ago, we saw a need to develop a company that could go out and do custom harvesting, bailing um, for local folks around us due to urban sprawl. Um, it was a whole lot cheaper for a guy that had a few cows to, to call us and let us come bail his hay than it was for him to spend $200,000 buying equipment to do it himself. Um, we saw that need arising and we kind of jumped off in this market and learned a lot of things the, the hard way, but learned a lot of things also from the university that really applied to what we do. Um, I am the eighth generation on our family farm. Um, we started in 1832. My, uh, in the middle of the picture right there, that redheaded gentleman and the blackheaded gentleman is my oldest and middle son. Um, if you want to see our crew, that's it. Uh, me and dad and those two boys, uh, last year bailed over 13,000 rolls. Um, and myself, I, I also work for General Mills making cereal on nights or days, depending on what my schedule is. So we, uh, we stay pretty busy. Um, kind of something I'll dive off into is, you know, that the, the the systems that we have here in Georgia, we're very blessed with. Um, I have bounced a lot of information off of the Dr. Tucker, um, Dr. Dr. Lisa as well, you know, stuff that we've come across that I wasn't real sure about. Um, so it, it's been a, a real pleasure being able to work with those guys and learn things as we've learned them. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm and learned at a very young age how vital forage is and without forage a dairy operation is not going to make it uh so we learned at a very long young age about how important forage was um didn't know anything about baileage to be honest with you daddy often he, he jokes from time to time and says you know if, if we'd had baileage back when we was in the dairy business we might still be in the dairy business i'm glad we didn't have baileage back then <laughs> we uh we learned a lot from silage production growing up, but we also have learned a lot around how nice it's been with baleage. Um, so some, some points that I wanna talk about around baleage for us that we learned. Um, Lisa, you can go ahead and swap that next to the next slide. Sorry, y'all, I'm not real tech savvy. So I've, I've uh, had, to, had to rely on, on Lisa this morning. Um, if y'all look at that field right there, that was a great picture that I took that I thought, um, this is actually dry hay, not baleage, but it kind of alludes me into a point that I want to talk about. My first thing that I want to bring up is that, you know, you look out there and there, that's fescue and it's going to be a, I want to say that one cutting of fescue on that 35 acre field was almost 300 bales. Um, it was phenomenal what it made. But after the fact, we did a forage sample. Um, and found out that we pretty much had a fescue that was wheat straw. Um, very low quality, very low uh, TDN, um, just was not what we wanted it to be, but we had a lot of it. Um, we learned real fast that, you know, we, we spent some time working with a seed company out of Rome, um, Southeastern Agri Seed, that Josh Baker has really helped us. We, we figured out that the the better product you put in the ground the better baleage you're going to make um just because you make a lot of it doesn't mean you've got a lot of really good feed and especially with baleage you know just because it goes in that white plastic tube and doesn't enzyme does not mean when it comes out that it's going to be a perfect blend of forage quality for your cattle um lisa you can go ahead and swap so this is some Bermuda grass we bailed. And if you'll look across that field, the, the reason I use this picture is this was some pretty good Bermuda grass. Um, but from a baleage standpoint, if you'll look across that field, something that we found to be very, very key to our inline wrapper, um, you know, the, the Anderson representative was like, yeah, you know, you, you load your bales on and the machine pushes it up and it wraps them and it's, it's, it's no big deal. Okay. Sounds good. Well, the, the uniformity and the tightness of a bale has 
been crucial to making better baleage for us. Um, we found that the first year of doing baleage, we had some inadequate bale sizes and we had some variation in the bale sizes. Um, we created more gaps in between bales and didn't have quite the fermentation that we wanted. We would actually, when we open the tubes up um, to start feeding the hay and our feeding the baleage in the wintertime, we found some white surface mold only at the joint. When the bale would be open and unrolled or however we decided to feed it, um, there was actually no problem on the inner part of the bale, but it was the facing of the bale joints where we didn't have good compression um, because of the inadequate shape of the bales. Um, Lisa, you can go ahead. So this is the number one thing that we have learned in the baleage business. Um, what you're looking at right there was a, was a custom job we did for a farmer. Um, there's right at 2,000 rolls in that one location right there. Um, biggest takeaway that I want anybody on this presentation to take away, when you are making baleage in a tube, and with this, as you can tell, this is a tube wrapper. Um, when you are making baleage, select the correct location. Um, we did some baleage for a gentleman that everything looked good for me. It was our second year doing baleage, you know, still a little green behind the ears, didn't know a whole lot about it. Uh, but the gentleman said that, hey, I want to put the tube along this fence line right here. That way, come winter. Um, I can pull in the field, grab the hay off the fence line, put it on the trailer, do whatever he's going to do with it to feed it. I said, sure, no problem, wherever you'd like to put it. So that's exactly what we did. Um, four weeks later, he calls me and says, hey, can you bring your wrapper down here? I need to rewrap this baleage. And I said, excuse me? Um, where we put that tube, rain actually came down the hill, and the tube created a dam. And when I say dam, I mean water backed up enough that it actually picked up that tube and floated it over six foot to a fence. And on the other side of the fence was a group of hungry cows. So they were starting to tear into his baleage that was four weeks old that he was supposed to start feeding in February, or excuse me, in, in the wintertime. So needless to say, be very, very careful where you put your tube. Um, we, if you look at this, if, at the photo, at the photo, it's kind of hard to tell, but from the left-hand side of the screen down toward the right, um, kind of tapers down in the hill. And as you can tell, the, the tube will kind of taper over slightly to the left, um, just to kind of create, so we don't create an erosion effect. Um, once that tube, once that water comes down that hill in between those tubes, um, we put that curve in there just to kind of prevent any kind of washes that we could create. So uh, spend a little extra time making a little better effort, um, making sure that we did the right thing. Um, all right, Lisa, you can go ahead. So I use this picture for, for one of two reasons. Um, first reason, this was the first year that we ever planted sedan grass. Um, we did not follow the recommendations that were given to us by our wonderful seed salesman. He told us that we needed to do the correct things to make sure that we got a adequate start for our sedan grass. Well, as you can see, it doesn't look to be that bad, correct? Well, it, it was marginal at best. Quality wasn't the best in the world. Um, was not the seed's fault. It was our fault. Um, that being said, the bales that we made coming off of this crop, we didn't really weigh them. We just kind of figured, you know, everybody, everybody always says a, suit, uh, a bale of baleage is going to weigh about 1,400 pounds. Um, this stuff with a finer stem was super, super heavy, um, around the tune of 1,800 pounds per bale. Um, make sure that if you ever decide to get in the baleage business, that you have the correct equipment to handle it because this stuff is no joke. We found out the hard way we busted a planetary on a Kubota tractor on the front end by hauling too much weight on the front of a tractor bouncing across a field. So make absolutely sure that you have the correct equipment to handle what you're gonna do. 
So the second part of this picture is, is we're actually using, this is a frail type conditioner, contrary to what was said earlier in the talk today about using a frail type conditioner on a sedan grass more of a stemmier crop. Um, the, the conditioner did okay when cutting this crop here, but there is an absolute science to what Lisa said around using a roller conditioner for a heavier stem crop. Those guys at the university have got this figured out and me saying, hey, this is uh, this will work, this will work. Yes, it will get you by, but trust me, when you lose what little leaf you can see that I had there, it was very detrimental to my crop. All right, Lisa, you can go to the next. Now, this is one year later, exact same field, exact same spot, just a little tighter picture. This is what happens when you follow the seed recommendations of the, or the recommendations of a seed salesman. This is the exact same crop, the sedan grass, exact same day, well, exact same time period for growth from the last picture. As you can tell, there is a huge difference. What you put in the ground, you're going to make a better bellage to put in your tube or your single bales. This here was, a was to me, was slightly over mature. It had a little bit, a little more stem that I wanted to it. Um, but again, per speculative suggestions of seed salesmen, this was correct. So we end up making that, there's a 30 acre field right there. That 30 acre field made almost 400 rolls of sedan grass. It was very thick, very gnarly. It was very tough on the equipment. We were not prepared for what we were getting into with this crop. So that being, again, let me reiterate, before you decide to plant certain crops to do for bailage, consult someone that's done it before, because we didn't, and we were very surprised at what we came across. So go, go ahead, Lisa, sorry. This is, this is pretty much the same picture, just off the tractor. Um, that's a 110 horse tractor. Uh, that grass is approximately five foot tall or so, five and a half foot tall. So that shows you just kind of a more broad picture of that grass. It uh, We did very well that year. This was the, and I can't remember the number. My, my seed sales was going to be upset with me, but I can't remember the number of what this crop was, but it actually had the, the millet in with it. Um, was very pleased with what we got off of it. We found through working with Dr. Tucker, you know, I seen this stuff, seen how big the leaf was and how great it looked. I'm thinking, okay, we're gonna have a pretty hot commodity right here. One thing that I have found is that some of the summer annuals don't come back with quite as high a RFQ that I was wanting to see on the, the force tests. But I will say, when you add a sugar content check in with your with your forage sample test and you check the sugar contents on this stuff, it, it brings it up much higher than a regular RFQ test does. You, you just have to remember to figure in your sugars to that. Because if you look at those tires on that tractor out there, they look kind of kind of wet looking. Um, that's actually sugars is coming off of a sap on those stalks. So go ahead, Lisa. All right, so that is my uh, now 16-year-old son moving the wrapper um, down across the field. One thing that he has learned and that I have learned is moisture. So Lisa kind of hit on it earlier in her talk today about being that 40 to 60% range. Um, that is absolutely crucial. Um, we just finished up our bailage that we were doing about a week ago, week and a half ago, um, which is very late for ryegrass. We cut it that morning, raked it at lunch, bailed it at one o'clock, and it was in a tube by dark. That's because when we started cutting, the ryegrass coming out of the back of the, the cutter was right at 62%. So we gave it a little bit and that was cutting it with a dew on it at eight o'clock in the morning. 
So you got to be very, very patience oriented <laughs> when it comes to baleage, because when we started cutting baleage in March of this year, um, we would, we would cut grass down on a Monday and it may be late Tuesday afternoon before we started baling just because we couldn't get it down into that 60% range. Um, we may be different than some producers. We actually don't tether our baleage. We actually cut it behind the conditioner or we actually run a Vermeer uh, trail mower and use both mowers, lay the hay down, come back in, rake it up, bail it, so whole nine yards. So one thing that I would like to highlight that we tried last year and we've actually decided we're not going to try it again this year. Um, he's moving that wrapper down to wrap corn. We actually made some corn baleage, not out of a forage corn, but out of a conventional seed production basis corn. It was quite the learning experience. Um, we had to use more net wrap. We had to use more plastic. It was cost inhibitive for it to work. Um, but I will say we actually saw pretty good results out of it. We were worried that the stage that we were in, that the cows would not eat it as well because of the salt stalk size. But we ended up having pretty good success with it. Just very, very hard on equipment. So we, uh, we've, we've decided we're going to step away from that this year. All right, Lisa, go right ahead. All right, so this picture here is actually some ryegrass that we bailed um, early in the season of last year that we was a, was a little bit thin. It was actually the, the first cutting. So I, I want to reiterate, and I know that I've said it a, a dozen times as it is, um, when you're planting your crop, whatever it's going to be, when you're planting your, your crop for your, your baleage, Again, this year we planted in this in this field that you're looking at. We planted. We got with our seed so at, over Josh Baker over at uh, Southeastern Agri Seeds and planted a Bacuiano. Forgive me if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, that was a tetraploid. Didn't know much about what a tetraploid was, but I had heard of it. Just didn't know much about it. And when we harvested that stuff in the it was a little more mature than i wanted we were starting to set kind of that doe stage head um but when we when we harvested it and wrapped it and put it in a tube it ended up right at 12 bales to the acre that was a 52 inch bale averaging right at 1460 pounds of bale um that was huge for us seeing that when we actually used a good seed we got a whole lot better results. So and I know I keep harping on that, but to make yourself successful in this, we have found the hard way that just the conventional Japanese ryegrass that grows up every year, yeah, it'll, it'll make something. But when you go on the back end and you look at those forage tests, that's when you realize that, hey, you know, if I'm gonna do this, why do the same work for less quality? And that was one thing for us that kind of kind of made a lot of sense. Um, one thing that, to, to, again, around the moisture to hit around, um, you know, we we I heard the story from from Dr. Hancock before he had he had moved on, and Dr. Dr. Lisa and Dr. Tucker as well. You know, about a microwave, you do microwave test. So I come home from my first bailing school I ever went to, which was three or four or five years ago, whenever it was. And uh, sure enough, they said, don't use your wife's microwave. Well, I didn't, but I used a regular microwave. That was, we had one in the garage that we had gotten, that my wife had put out there that she, we got an updated one. So I said, I'll use it. So we used it and I'm here to tell you, it was done. Problem is you make sure that when you put that back in the garage that you tell your wife that you used it for that. Because uh, if she ever decides to bring in the house and use it for something, She's not going to be very happy because it makes a pretty good odor in those things. But uh, the microwave tester for us to, for testing moisture is spot on. Don't miss. It's perfect. But I'll be honest with you. 
we don't have the time to do it. So what we have come accustomed to doing is we use a bucket tester that we have. We use a sensor that's in the baler and I have worked as hard as I can to calibrate myself and my dad and my son for us to all have the, the feel of, of where we need to be as far as the calibration standpoint to make sure our moisture is in that 60 to 40% range. Now, if we have some that we're pushing that we're trying to get it close, yes, we will take the time to do it correctly because I'm not going to make bad product. So again, if you're going to do the moisture tester in the microwave, make sure you use an old one, label it and don't use it again. All right, Lisa, you can go ahead. So as you can tell, we, we run a Kubota and a John Deere baler. So the John Deere baler does not have knives. The Kubota baler does have knives. This here was a sedan grass that got too dry on us. And when I say too dry, it got below 40%. And at 40%, we stop. We don't bail anymore because I'm not going to put up bad product for someone else or myself. So once it got below the 40%, we actually stopped bailing, left the, left the crop there, and actually went back and bailed it up as dry hay and would use and used it to feed over the winter as a dry hay filler. It was the crop was not wasted by doing that, but the cows didn't like it quite as well as they would have. It was pretty much like watching them eat Johnson grass. And I hate to put it that way, but that's is the best way I could put it. So, all right, go ahead, Lisa. All right, so this is absolutely one of my favorite slides, and I'll tell you why. That was my that's my truck right there. I actually I actually traded it in Wednesday of this week, but anyway, that's our trailer. So if you look, there's oh 12, 16 bales in that trailer. Oh, that ain't no big deal. 16 bales. Well, you do the math at 1,500 pounds per bale, it is very easy to overload your equipment. Um, we have, like, again, we have learned the hard way. Know what you have before you start down this road. Um, Baleage is very, very rewarding for us. Um, we actually have gone away from, we feed our brood cows very, very little feed um, throughout the year. And for us, when, when the math is done, um, what we have come up with, the way we feed our baleage to our cattle, is we've got about 67 to $72 a bale, or excuse me, 62 to $72 a ton in baleage. Again, we do it ourselves, but 62 to $72 a ton in baleage, and I can't buy feed for less than $250 a ton. Um, so, but it took a year or two to get our cows acclimated to the point that we could come move away from, from feed completely and go to a straight grass basis with the baleage, hay, um, and that kind of thing. So, all right, go ahead, Doc. So again, as I alluded earlier, I, we run a Vermeer trail mower and a, uh, Kubota disc cutter that's the got the conditioner in it truthfully and i'm speaking for from my perspective um we see just as fi fast of drying on baleage with the trail mower as we see with the conditioner and i'll tell you why even with the conditioner opened all the way up in the back it still makes a smaller windrow coming out the back of it whereas the trail mower the hay is pretty much laid down in a 10 foot wide swipe where it goes and is evenly laid across. Um, it does not pile it together. So therefore with baleage, we see not much difference in drying time between the conditioner and the trail mower. All right, go ahead. So this is the next thing I wanted to get to. One thing about making your baleage, especially in the summertime. This is sugarcane aphids. We have really good results that we've seen with the sedan grass. Um, 
but this is one of the side notes. You have to watch for the aphids. We were actually cutting this down. This was actually being cut probably two weeks before it was actually ready. Um, but because of the sugarcane aphid, we went ahead and cut it down. Now there is some stuff that you can use to help you with some prevention of those, those, those pests. But again, it takes a little more work just to be able to get out there, scout your crops, make sure you know what you're looking for. And we generally don't see these show up until after that July time frame, but they have been there earlier than that. So, all right, go ahead. And I get to this. This was probably one of the scariest days of my life. Um, that baler went from making a bale of hay to the what you see right there in about 42 seconds. Um, we were baling some baleage with a baler that was not specifically recommended for baling baleage and had a little bit too heavy of a load on a bearing, uh, dropped a spark out of a bearing, and you see the result. So before you try to make baleage, again, before you try to make baleage, make sure that you have the equipment to handle what you're wanting to do. Um, this was it's a very good learning experience. And the next one I would say is make sure you have insurance on your equipment. Luckily we did, <laughs> but again, you know, I, I just want everybody to understand that baleage can be a very challenging crop, but it can be very rewarding as well. One thing that I would like to add as I'm closing down here is that uh, never do more, never cut down more than you can do in a day. So our first first started doing baleage, you know, we were used to doing dry hay. We could lay down 60 acres in a day, you know, no problem, get it bailed up, no big deal. Uh, I remember the, the first night of wrapping hay on a 30 acre field that we laid down, um, it was almost four o'clock in the morning before we were through wrapping hay because we didn't anticipate what we were getting into. Um, so I will say, if you are going to try baleage, cut down small, five, 10, whatever you want to do, acre tracks to fill out if you're going to have problems with the baler, if you're going to have problems with the rake, if you're going to have problems with the wrapper, um, or even just getting the product from the field to the wrapper, make absolutely sure that you do it with small portions to start with so that you don't get yourself in a position that we were in at four o'clock in the morning, finishing wrapping hay. So again, I'll take any questions from here. Actually, I've got a couple of videos, I think on here, Lisa, that it doesn't really show a lot, but this is just a field of ryegrass that we did. Um, that's got a little, little drone footage if you want to run it and see if some people can see it. I don't know if, I don't think it has any sound to it, but it, this was kind of a, an overview. Uh, it looks like I don't have video capability. It's just the okay little shot that you had in the slide. Gotcha, gotcha. So, but anyway, this was a uh, this was a ryegrass field that we did, um, and actually had the Kubota rep come out that day and was kind of doing some demo stuff with us. But, uh, but anyway, you know, there's there's a I'm, I'm always open for questions. You know, if anybody's got any questions or needs anything. Um, myself or my dad, either one, you know, we'll be glad to help out with anything because we got a lot of help from from the doctors there at the university that kind of steered us in the right direction. And again, don't don't be surprised if you experience some some difficult days when doing bailage, but just know that what you're doing is worth what you're doing. So that's all I've got. Uh, this is a little quote that I like that uh, people told us we were crazy. We were getting in the bailage business and said, uh, said, all right, y'all never make any, any nobody's going to ever pay somebody to do that. Well, we've done, I'm not going to say we've done very well, but we've, we've kept our business going once people realized that there was a, a need for this to be out there. So. All right, thank you, BJ. Um, those are all the presentations we have for today. Thank you all for sticking with us through all the 
technical difficulties that we had here to the end. Um, I did just drop a link in the chat box um, to a survey, and I will likely send that out via email if you don't know how to navigate to the chat box. Um, just addressing what you learned during this training and, and what impact you foresee that having on your farm. Um, your response is greatly appreciated in terms of uh, helping uh, extension faculty here through their promotion and tenure processes and documenting the impact of, of these programs. Um, so if you have any questions for any of the speakers, we'll hang out here for a few minutes um, and you can drop those in that, that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. All right, Travis 